Okay. Thanks a lot for joining today. The weather outside is gorgeous. It's Friday afternoon and you're still sitting here. I really appreciate it. Those of you who are watching in July, I'm sorry. And I don't know why, I think there are still some people in the other classroom. There is like plenty of space here, at least for 200 people. You can come down here. It's very quiet, apart from me speaking. Anyway, so we started learning about processors and last week, last week, yesterday, I was talking about the MIPS uh, architecture. What we learned were the instructions. And we looked at these instructions. We said, hey, there's a number of things a processor can do. The architecture describes what you can do uh, at every step. And we realized that we operate on data, bring it together somehow, edit, subtract it. That seems to be the main thing we are doing, adding, subtracting. Every now and then there is an or and popping up. And then we realized that to do these operations, we need to find the data from somewhere. And um, we quickly brushed over it. We said, yeah, we need to work on data. There is this thing we call memories. Everybody knows what the memory is or the computer memory is. We didn't look at it too much. And uh, we just said that it's, it's sort of a black box kind of thing. Uh, so this is from the book. Uh, we said there are these locations in the memory, they have addresses, and there were, you know, we could say a memory has a certain bit width, it could be 32, could be anything else, and then you bring an address to it, this is the address, and at every location, so I don't know, this is a location 0000, zero, 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 zero. we argued that there could be different numbering schemes for the addresses, we said there is word, Sorry, wasn't a question, okay. So we said there were word-based addresses, byte-based addresses and things like that. And in each of these locations, there would be some data. And we had these instructions that would move that data from the memory, which we learned was very, very far away and was very, very slow or things like that. And then we could bring it closer to the processor where, can, where we can deal with it. So this is what we were talking about. Now, today, for the last time, if you believe me, uh, we will be looking a little bit again into the circuit side of things, trying to understand what are our options for these memories? Why are they so slow, so ugly, so problematic? Uh, that will help us understand some of the things we are doing a little bit better. Later in the lecture, in uh, four weeks, five weeks, we will still be bothered by this memory. In fact, if you're in computer architectures, if you are uh, serious about making higher performance things, memories are the only things that bother you. You will be trying to make them better, safer, nicer, faster, faster, more. And uh, uh, these days, so in the 2020s, uh, most of uh, computer architecture research is actually about where to put the data, how to move the data, how to work with the data. And so memory is the central part. So today we want to uh, sort of kind of round things up. And there were a few, there was one little thing that I forgot uh, for the sequential building block. And uh, yesterday when we were talking about the program, we said the program is just like any data. It will be somewhere in the memory, and there will be a pointer to it. We said this is going to be the program counter, and it tells us where to find the ones and zeros that will end up being our program. And then we said we will take this one instruction, whatever it could be, add uh, something like $0, $1, $2, $1, S0, S1, S2, sorry and uh, do something with it. And then we will know that this guy will point to the next instruction, then to the next instruction, then to the next instruction. And it will go through the, let's say, 
uh, memory space to go through the memory. So we need a thing that we call the counter. Well, this is a program counter PC. So maybe we should also briefly talk about what the counter is. So this is the first thing that we will very quickly go over. And then we will discuss what are our options for storing data? Why do we like one? Why don't we do it the other way? And then we will spend the, the rest of the day discussing how these data is organized in an array in the memory. Why is it done that way? What does it mean for us and why we care? Sounds good? Okay, so let's go. Counters. Well, I told you we would be done with this, but one last one, okay? It's not so difficult. Uh, why do I need something like this? Very obvious. At some point, I'm going to need a program counter that is going to point to the next address which contains the program that I want to execute. And uh, this system is actually quite simple. At every clock cycle, we have a value, a count, and we want that this is incremented by one, or in our case, if we are having bytes, addresses by four, or by eight, or whatever. So you can keep on incrementing. And there is nothing very exciting about it, if you think. Uh, this is our state holding element. So this is our actual program counter. And then we can use an adder or an incrementer to modify the value. So this would be the next value. When the clock edge comes, we move from this side, from this count to the next one. Now, if we were only having a very, very simple counter, we could execute a program that goes this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. At some point, we realize that we maybe don't have programs that only go one way. We may have something called loops, or we may want to modify the address. And at that point, maybe we are going to add a multiplexer here between the output, what was going to be the next address, and what we want to be the next address. And we are going to modify it, just to give you a heads up. Then yesterday, when we were talking, we were saying that what happens when you uh, reset the system. And we said, by convention, this, this address a very specific address is usually in MIPS, the default address when you turn the device on. So how can I reset the address here? Well, I have my asynchronous reset, and this is, in, in the MIPS case, this would be... Okay, there is some funny echo. You hear that? Okay. Standing wave. Can we reduce the volume maybe? Yeah. Okay. So uh, where was I? 32 bits. I, I would have 32 registers, uh, 32 flip-flops here, and I can set them so that this pattern appears when I apply the reset. So the moment that you press the reset button or power the device on, you know that you would be ending at this location. There's nothing more or more interesting to say about counters at the moment. If you have any questions, this would be an ideal time to ask. One question that came up yesterday during uh, while we were discussing is, uh, they said, hey, you have so many registers, uh, like you know that you had a zero register, you had this. Why isn't this program counter part of the registers that we have? And the answer is simple because those registers can be used for anything, can be modified by any instruction and things like that. Whereas the program counter is a very specific register that tells us where to find the next thing in the memory so that we can execute part of the program. And we don't want, I mean, we want it sometimes to be modified by an instruction, but those instructions are special when we want to make a function call, when we want to make a branch, if we are making a for while if uh, statement where we change the flow of the program, we may want to modify the program counter uh, extraordinarily. Normally, it would just be counting up. 
And uh, some instructions can manipulate the program counter, but unlike other registers, not you don't need that all other um, instructions modify it directly. So this is why it was kept, it's always kept uh, separate. Okay. It's a quiet day today. Okay, so let's motivate memory elements. A significant portion of a, a modern circuit is memory. What would be your guess if we open any chip in any laptop, how much of it do you think is memory? Like this? 20? We have 20%, that's a lot. You say? 10%. Going down, going down. Yes? That is very bold. Okay, so let's just uh, go to this slide. So this is not the latest chip or something like that. Latest chips are a little bit boring these days because the technology has shrunk so much that these pictures don't look so good. So we usually tend to pick earlier chip photographs where we see a little bit more. So this is in 45 nanometers. Uh, some chip from the 2010, middle 2015s or so, uh, from Intel. And uh, here, the ones that I shaded are larger memory blocks. This is not all the memory. There is still uh, little pieces in here that is most probably memory, but I was A, too lazy, and B, uh, not so knowledgeable to be able to say 100% those are memories. So anything that has this nice regular array structure, in this case, these are caches, uh, roughly half of a modern chip will be memories. There are chips that would have mostly memories. 80 would still be a little bit on the higher side, but you know, not so bad. 10% would be very rare. I'm... Mr. 10%, 20%, that's, uh, I mean, I wish it was like that, but modern chips, a lot of the area ends up being memory. Uh, they are very practical tools for system designers. We love, as electrical engineers, we like system designers. They draw some block diagrams, here be memory, here be processor, everything solved. And then they will tell us, go do it. And we will say, what the, anyway. Uh, memories are very practical, seriously. It allows you reconfigurability, programmability, allows you to, uh, to, to change the system, adapt the system very easily. Uh, you store the data and work on the stored data. And um, there are some algorithms, some, some tasks that are done on streaming data. Those are for us, for, uh, for hardware designers, those are the best kind of things. Data comes in, and as it flows in, we just modify, transform it, and kick it out from the other side. Those are great. And uh, as, as much as we love it, a lot of the uh, processing that we have to do cannot be done that way. We have to, for example, ingest a large data frame, a, an entire picture, a video, a, a, a database, to be able to continue working. So we need to access a large scale data before we can produce something meaningful and spit out. In this case, data is not coming in the same rate and going out the same rate. Uh, so for those, we have to do it. The data type that we are uh, trying to process determines also the storage. So if you are, you know, uh, one of the best deals in human history probably, was charging 20 cents for an SMS. I mean, that was gorgeous. <laughs> and nobody, I mean, nobody even said like, why does it cost 20, 20 cents? Like it's 160 bytes and the latency, the amount of time it takes to go to the other side doesn't really matter. You could, it could be two seconds delayed. Who cares? Nobody will notice if the SMS comes two seconds late. Try to hold a conversation where the other person's reply comes two seconds later. It's almost impossible. Uh, if you go to, I believe, in, in Lucerne, in Fekas Museum, they had a communication thing where they were delaying the responses. Uh, above anything about 200 milliseconds, humans will get confused. 
So this was a great deal. Uh, you have very small amount of data, and the data is not timing critical. You can do with it as you please. One second of normal audio requires 64 kilobytes. We are not talking about high fidelity, stereo, whatever. This is like uh, talking on the cell phone thing. So one second is 64 kilobytes. And one high definition picture, so we are talking about 1080, is 7.3 megabytes. So for all of those who are sending, you know, when there's something not working on your screen, and instead of you know, sending that as a text message, taking a, your cell phone, making a 25 megapixel image, sending it to your assistant, I have an error message, are doing this instead of that. Glaciers melting, my God. Okay, so this we already showed, there is a lot of memory. We will see why we use that much memory also later in the lecture in five weeks when we talk about caches and cache hierarchies. So even without me knowing what this is, first of all, uh, these things are look very nicely symmetric, right? You have this thing here and then this thing here. What is this? It's a dual core processor, core one, core two. What is this big thing on the side? Well, you know, Moore's law gives you a lot of area. Well, one core fits, then another core fit. After a while, they say, okay, we also need some memory, so you splash the cache to the next side. Uh, so this is, this is how the modern designs go. Now, how can we store data? We already know we can design flip-flops. We know them, we've used them, we synthesize them. Uh, we could also use latches, but for some reason, we are always fixated on flip-flops. We know that they are very fast. And the best part is, if I have 1,000 flip-flops in my design, all 1,000 of them I can access at the very same time. That's the idea, right? That's the state. And we never say, hey, the state can be 32 bits, 64 bits. It can be any size, any range, anything. 16,742 bits. Why not? So this is great. There is one problem, though. It's quite expensive. Because uh, for one bit, well, you need transistors and not one transistor. For If you remember back in the beginning of the sequential story, we were talking about latches. We said, ah, oh, there is like these two inverters back to back. Then there were these switches that were opening. And then we said, hey, we can use two of those. And there are two here, two here two here, two here, my God, then there is more here, more here, more here. So you end up with something like 20, 26 transistors per bit stored. I'm not even talking about how we access and make sense of it, but this is very nice, very fast, very great, but it costs a lot. And uh, we are very hungry for data. We need to store them somewhere. So we don't like it so much that we need to spend so much space. So our first solution is what we call static RAM, RAM for random access memory. And we will talk about that uh, quite a bit in the next uh, 40 minutes or so. These guys are relatively fast. And the great story is they are less expensive. One bit will cost us six transistors. So we went from 20, 24 something to six, four times savings, meaning that I can, I can put four times more data into the same area. But nothing is for free, right? I mean, if I have this great thing that I'm using less transistors, at some point I'm going to pay. And the thing I'm paying will be uh, that I will say, you know, I may have a million bits. The only concession I'm making is that I will not be able to have access to all of them at the same time. I will only be able to read one word at a time. The word could be 32, 64, 75, 13, whatever bits. But I don't have access to all of them in parallel. Now, you could say, that's a bad deal. I don't like it. Well, then you can use flip-flops, latches, have access to all of them parallel. But in a lot of cases, you realize, I need tons of bits. And you know what? It's not ideal. 
but I'll live with it. I'll, I'll work around this limitation because I save a lot of area. And that's what I do. Now, when you go to a place and you make a deal and they say, you know, this thing costs 100 and then you say, ah, uh, uh, what about, I'm a student, will you make a reduction? And say, oh, okay, I'll give it to you for 20. What will you do next? You will ask, can I do it for five? You know, because you already realize that the guy's going down. So why not ask for more? So <laughs> the second thing is, uh, we are not happy with how much area that we are using, and every transistor will require some physical area. Those are, you know, those gates, transistors, vein sources, whatever. Uh, physical presences on the thing, and we say, we want it cheaper. Can I use only one transistor per data bit that I store? And we say, yeah, sure. Let's introduce you the dynamic RAM. We will briefly talk about it. But now the um, price gets more and more and more. We will be slower. Every time we read something, the content will get destroyed. And we can have one data at a time. And even better, which I didn't write here, if you don't read it, the data will also get destroyed. So it's great if you can quickly you know, write something and then read something back, that's OK. But don't keep it there for a long time. And we cannot make it in the same process like we are making the rest of the chip. We need a very specialized, crazy process for some funny reasons. Uh, those are some issues. But it's cheaper. <laughs> and you will see that some people cannot resist this and will go and, uh, and say, we will use it. In a computer, you usually would have your main processor that would use static RAMs because they are manufactured in the same technology as you make the rest of the logic. And the more, ex what we call external memory will be additional chips outside, usually in modules or soldered onto your FPGA on the side. Uh, those would be dynamic RAM blocks uh, because they are also manufactured in a separate technology. Now, when you come to the latest and greatest and craziest ideas, what they do is they assemble a number of different chips together and put them into the same package. And that's why, you know, from the outside, you see one package, but inside there's multiple different things uh, joining in. There was, I believe, a question. These are all static grams. The ones that I highlighted are all static grams. It's a good question. You know why I say they are static grams very easily? Because they have like this big array-like structure. We are going to talk about that. You see that in the middle there is something, and then the left side and the upper side, uh, sorry, the bottom side and the upper side are the same. It's like symmetric along this axis. That's an array type of organization. That's what you see when we design RAMs. The, the reason why we end up with this thing is this array-like structure. So anywhere where you see like these large, broad arrays, you can very quickly say, this is a static RAM. You'll be right 90, 95% of the time. There are some similar looking things that would fool you, but you know, you can't go wrong. You can't go much wrong when you just identify them. There are smaller ones here, like these ones. They are probably also static grams. The flip-flops are buried under these blue-looking things, and they are distributed. They don't have this regularity. There is like one flip-flop here. There is another one here. There is another one here. Maybe seven of them are next to each other, or 30 of them are next to each other. But on such a design, you would have, I don't know, anywhere between 200, 500,000 flip-flops. They are not like all neatly organized in an array. OK. So what else do we have? Well, a lot of you are used to it by now uh, that you have these little SD cards, right? USB sticks, 
uh, NVMe disks, SSD, solid state drives. It used to be that external memories uh, were done uh, magnetically. Hard disks, you know, they were rotating disks and they had magnetic coating and you could change the uh, polarity of those things where no transistors are directly involved. It's just a ferromagnetic material covering the surface and there would be this head going over it and you could feel whether or not there was like the magnetic rotation was this way or that way and one of them would be one, the other one would be zero. Or we have flash drives where essentially you have an oxide where you tunnel some charges through and if that poor charge is stuck there, you will notice it. You say, ah, you charge, you are there. And um, so writing is a bit difficult, but reading is very easy. The same way we are uh, generating a lot of what we call non-volatile memory uh, types. There are spintronics, there are resistive RAMs, there is all kinds of magnetic RAMs. There are all kinds of ideas where they want to reduce the per bit cost, store more data in a smaller area. They actually work on uh, the advantages or what we try to do here, trying to reduce the transistor, can we do it even less? Now, the variation is great. There's many, many ideas. And when the per bit cost is lower, you will realize there will be costs associated. Some of them, for example, can uh, read very fast, but not write very fast. Maybe that's okay for you, you know? Uh, some of them you can only write, well, you cannot write many times, like 10 times. Maybe that's okay, because, you know, if you have a cell phone and that cell phone uh, has some, you know, boot memory, a firmware, that firmware can get updated 10 times. I mean, you are not going to update it 100 times. Maybe that's okay. Uh, but if it's your computer, you know, you can save your email five times and then, you know, you can throw the computer away. That's not, that's not what you want to do. So these are our options. And as we were discussing, uh, architecture, microarchitecture design is all about finding the, um, finding the compromises that, wants, that we want to work well. Now, apart from the first row that we had here, apart from the flip-flops and latches where we have the entire flexibility that we can imagine. We can do anything and everything we can do with them. But once you want to come down here or here or here, the solution, the first thing that saves a lot of effort is, is sacrificing on the parallel access. You say, okay, I can have a million bits, and as long as I can only access a subset of them at a time, I could be better. And this is what you end up with, an array organization of memories. So this is what I also try to depict here, uh, the image that we had before. We have a number of entries in the array, and uh, we have an address that tells us which entry of the array we have, and then every entry has a certain bit size. This is physically fixed when you manufacture them, as you saw in the picture the array will have a physical size. So it could be 64, 32, 45, 17, any number, uh, any number that, that serves us well. They can be designed and manufactured like that. So the data is n bits, and we have an array that we are addressing with n bits. If I have n bits, the array can contain up to two to the n entries. Does that make sense? So if I were to write down some funny numbers, so if n, the addresses is 10, I could have two to the 10 addresses, right? That would mean 1,024 entries. And each entry, if it is m equals to 32, I would have thir roughly 32,000 bits. Or you can say 32 bits is four bytes, and then this one would be four kilobytes times
Okay, who has a computer with more than four kilobyte memory? Okay, you should probably upgrade, yeah. <laughs> it's uh, not so good. But, you know, I mean, it's very easy if we have uh, 20 address bits, we can have a megabyte. If we have 40 and, and things and things, so things can scale uh, quite a lot. Now, the only, uh, you see, this thing doesn't make sense. In a few slides, I will be showing things that don't make sense. I'll show very small examples where the array is minimal. That is so that it can fit into the slide. In real life, the sizes we are looking at are around these things or even larger. Um, and uh, now you can ask, hey, Frank, how, how come we can have like a megabyte, 10 megabytes, 100 megabytes, one terabyte of memory? Well, we can combine these things, right? We can have multiple of them parallel. We can, you know, have multiplexers to choose. Well, this is the first four kilobyte, the next four kilobyte, the next four kilobyte, and make an array of these arrays, and then an array of an array of an array, and, and have a hierarchy that lets us find the data that we are looking for. Now, the only concession that we made is that we are reading out only, in this case, for example, only 32 bits. It could be any size, but that's the, that's the uh, concession that we made. It allows me to keep 32,000 bits, but at any given time, I can only read out 32 or write 32. If that's okay, we are in business, we can use these things. So now let's try to take a look at it. As I said, we are looking at pathetically small memories here. Real memories don't look like this. So N and M, they use two. So we have four locations and uh, three bits. Uh, the example is from the book, don't blame me. Okay, and here we are holding a grand total of 12 bits. Don't try this at home, not a smart idea. Uh, usually, as I said, these numbers would be much, much larger. So here is, uh, once again, these things. Now that we have these different locations, I know that I have two addresses. Two addresses is two, uh, um, two address bits. They could be 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. So those are the addresses. And now you can talk about what value is stored in what address. It's the same organization as here. However, this guy probably had 4 billion entries and each one was 32 bits. Here I only have four words and each one of them is three bits so that it fits into the uh, example. Now, when we want to access it, these values, so I can access values three bits at a time and I want to find what is, I want to access this thing. I know its address is one zero. So I apply this address and I wait a little bit and then the output magically comes. And in this case, the output would have been one zero zero. Excellent, right? I agree. So this is the example that I was writing. So normally the arrays are not that small, but we are looking at larger arrays. Uh, if you are going down into the idea of classifying the memories, uh, we see two main styles. The first style, so all the memory uh, styles, we can say memory arrays. So the first type is non-volatile. That means that these memories do not need power. You can switch the device off. You can walk around with it. Don't connect it to any power source. They will still keep their content. And then the other part are the volatile memories. If you remember the risk CISC discussion, reduce instruction set versus complex instruction set, people didn't start making volatile memories. They made memories which needed power. After a while, they said, hey, I can make things that are non-volatile. And then by definition, the other guys became volatile. Kind of a bum deal again. And when you look at the volatile memories, we will see these two uh, different parts. We have the static and the dynamic versions. 
This guy who tries. Ah. So static we call SRAM and dynamic we call DRAM. Now for non-volatile, we will talk about one version, which is the read-only memory. And then there are many, many sub versions of different technologies, how we, uh, how we can also uh, have non-volatile memories, which are usually not integrated into the chip themselves. So we will not uh, talk about it. So today, the, the parts we are talking about are ROM, the static SRAM, and the dynamic DRAM. OK. So who remembers this lovely back-to-back -back inverter uh, thing? Latches? Exactly. So this thing can hold uh, data. It has two stable states. We discussed this. We could hold it, uh, either this point is 1. If this point is 1, it inverts, hits 0. The input is 0. And this guy stays in a nice and tight, lovely loop. So we like this type of organization. And this is nothing different than what we had in the latch. Sorry, I'll have to draw it like this. This part is exactly identical. But now we want to save things. Notice that in the latches, we had all these switches that would open and close. And we had a case where we said, ah, oh, now the input is there. We will have a new input and things like that. We are not doing that here. This loop, these four transistors, keep the data as we sort them. We need to, at some point, access and uh, read or write into it. And for that, we are adding a little switch. And for that, we are adding a little switch. And we say, well, this is the data. And this is the inverse of data. Makes sense, right? And we say these guys that can open and close, I will control this. Let's pick a different color. And I will call this the word line. And if this guy is 0, these bits are not connected to my data lines. If this one is 1, these switches would close, and this guy is connected to the rest. So far, this is not so interesting. Or I think it's not so interesting. But the, the interesting part comes now. We can have many of those. So I can have another one here the same way. And they also have their switches. And they also have their word lines. Now, the concession I'm making was that I could only access one of them at a time. So I have a second word line here. And that one controls these guys. Now, what we are doing, something we said we should never do, we are connecting the output of these guys together. Bad, bad idea. As long as, at any given point, only one of these are connected, I'm good. So if I can manage to have an array structure where I have multiple of these uh, of these columns, where I only activate one of them and connect only one of them to the input, to these data and data bar lines, life is good. Any, everybody with me so far? Good. So the next thing we do is, this is one column. Well, I can make multiple columns. I can make 32 columns. 
So then this would be data one and data bar one. Here I can make a second column with, again, the same word line, third one, fourth one, 57th one, et cetera, et cetera. So this is how I can draw up my column. So essentially, I keep these guys isolated and they agree with each other. So if this is zero, this is one, this is one, this is zero. And since there is power here, this loop stays constant. As long as I have power turned on, they will not forget the content, what is stored in here. This is why we call them a static RAM. Let's come back to the RAM. RAM is called random access memory. And the randomness comes from the fact that you don't need to access them in order. So it's not like you have to access this one first, then this one, then this one, then this one. Give me the address. I can go and pick anything I want. So I could access them in any random order. This was a massive change from the other thing. If any one of you watches sci-fi movies from the 60s, sci-fi movies from the 60s? OK. Great thing. You will see like these, these people carrying like these big disks. And that would be the computer. They will have like one kilobyte of memory which is a magnetic tape that they are carrying, and they would put it there in the background. They would be rotating all the time. Looks like audio hi-fi equipment. No, they were computer memories. And since it's a tape, you would literally write things one after another. And then when you want to read it, you would read them in sequence. So it wasn't random, it was in sequence. And um, those of you, do you all use Linux, Unix? The command tar, tar is a tape archive, right? So it, it was made so that the things can be written on a tape as one file. So if you had the multiple files, you would make one file of it and then write it onto the tape. So this is why the random access memory is called, because data can be accessed in any order. There was a question that I, yeah. Um, by closing the word line, we can read the data, right? Yes. That is an excellent thing. Uh, you will love the writing part. <laughs> the reading part is easy, right? I mean, this is, do we have time? Oh, uh, let's close it with the, uh, with the writing. You will love this. So, if you want to write something, you first need to have access. So you need to close the, close this lovely word line. Let's say we are writing into the, into this row, okay, word line two. So we close them, and normally you could read out from here, but now you want to write it. The problem is this guy is insisting that this position is one, and this guy is insisting that this position is zero. You know what you do? <laughs> you will love this. You bring a bigger inverter. You connect <laughs> and you say, no, it is zero. And you overpower it, literally. That's what you do. <laughs> but the good news is you need one big guy in the entire memory array that can overwrite it. And you can have millions of small ones, but you need one big guy uh, to be able to overwrite it. To be honest, this is also not so difficult because the thing that we sell out in this memory, why did we do this array structure? We did it because we wanted to put more bits. And to put more bits was because we cared about the density. We wanted more bits. Uh, we are making these things as small as possible. So these are the tiniest, feeblest, littlest, you know, baby transistors. You know, they barely can say one, one, zero. And then someone comes and says, zero. And I say, okay, okay, whatever. That's literally how the things are done. I think it's a, with that anecdote, I'll leave you uh, for a break at quarter past. Let's continue.
Okay, okay. It seems like, oh, it seems like I confuse a lot of, a lot of people. So let's continue confusing people. I mean, that seems to be fun. Okay, so <laughs> we were looking at array organization of memories like this, where we have a certain bit with this, the physical implementation of the, of the data does not necessarily have to be what the processor uses. So you can have, uh, this thing could be 16, and you could put two of them side by side. So when you are reading it, you would read the left side would be the upper bits, the right side would be the lower bits. So you can combine them. So any combinations are still possible. Um, so we're looking at the array organization of bits. And the first thing that we, uh, we discussed was we could have these static RAMs where several transistors are used to keep things in a loop. And we said that, okay, there are two transistors here, two here, one each for these switches. In total, for one bit, I end up using six transistors. Sorry, yes. Um, why do we do uh, this thing now and not use our matches? Because they're always the same and they also need like two gates. Um, no. <laughs> no, we, we need more. We need a clock. We need, uh, we need these opening, closing things. We need to, and then, you know, the outputs are actually not shared. We don't have this sharing structure involved in it. Here, the outputs of 1,000 columns are all connected to the same line. So at any given time, only one of these rows is driving the output. All the others are, by the magic of the switches, word lines are being disconnected. So that's, that's the concession we make. We say, hey, you know, we cannot connect all the outputs together because there will be a nightmare. And some people, for example, want to take advantage of it. Why can I not make logical operations between two rows? Uh, that's part of the research uh, that also the Safari group is doing. And uh, then there are also unintended consequences, right? You say, hey, if I write to this row, uh, you know, they are connected. It's not like they are directly connected, but they are in the close vicinity. If I keep on writing into these things back and forth, maybe I can disturb the next guys. That's what ends up being row hammer uh, that, again, the Safari group is very famous for. So there's a lot of little, little things that go into these uh, discussions as well. But the general idea is we want to sacrifice um, accessibility by density. We want to make sure that I can store more bits with less transistors in a smaller amount, uh, in a smaller area. And accessing only 32, 64, whatever bits at a time doesn't seem to be the end of the world. I mean, ideally you would want to have 1,000 bits at a time, but you say, oh yeah, I'll, I'll leave it 32. I mean, it's not so bad. If I can have so many more bits, I'm down with it. Now, we call this, so the random access we discussed, we call it static because as long as there is power, notice that I'm not drawing it, but each of these inverters is connected to a power source. So as long as the power is there, those inverters will agree with each other. Say, ah, it's one, one, yeah, zero, zero. So they will stay constantly in this loop. The moment I switch off the power, they'll just forget it. And uh, this is why we end up calling them volatile memories. Uh, as long as you keep the power on, they will stay there. Now, uh, people were happy with it, but of course you need more data, more data, more data. I have not seen yet anyone saying I have enough memory or I have enough disk. I, uh, I, I am part of running a larger group and we are, at some point we asked, do you want more computers or do you want more disk? They would cost the same and they went for disk and they filled it. Anyway, the second thing is we say, can I do even better? And then you realize, electrically speaking, 
all you have to do is differentiate between something being there and not being there. You need to be able to differentiate two different electrical properties. And now you say, hey, let us use a capacitor. A capacitor, you know, has these two parallel plates. Electrons get, if there is an electric field across them, electrons get attracted. They are like these guys looking to the other side. They cannot get because there is a, you know, not conducting materials. And all electrons gather here saying, oh, what is it? What is it? Yeah, yeah, I want to go to the other side. No, I cannot. So they end up, the charges end up accumulating on one side of the plate, wanting to go to the other side, but they cannot. And we say, okay, if this capacitor is full, if it is charged, then we have a one. If it is not charged, if it is empty, then it's a zero. Uh, good. We can still use the sort of kind of array structure, right? We say, we can do this. We, instead of having this guy here, we now have a single capacitor. So we still have a switch and we have a capacitor and we connect this to the ground. So if the word line closes, I can, you know, with my big guy, bring some charges here, and I charge this capacitor up. And uh, if I want to read it, I just connect this switch, the word line, and if there are charges here, I will hopefully be able to detect the presence of those charges. That's the principle. And so all I have to do is, be able to differentiate between a capacitor that has charge and a capacitor that doesn't have charge. One of them could be one, the other one would be zero. I need one transistor still because I need to be able to control when to access the transistor because they are st uh, the, the capacitor because they are all still connected in this array fashion. It's just that what's inside the array has now changed. Now, this seems like a great idea, especially since uh, capacitors, first of all, don't look very dangerous and difficult to make. And you could probably make them. Now, the question is, how much, what do we want to make? We want to make them as small as possible. Now, here's the problem. If you make the capacitor small, the amount of charge they can hold is also small. That is not so much of a problem. The problem is, real life, these electrons, when you close this switch, don't stay there very long. The charges, electrons, whatever. They don't stay there very long. Why? First of all, we cannot make everything ideal. There is some leakage happening across here. This switch, although it should close and open, it doesn't completely open. It is mostly open, but there is a little, little bit going through. Now, that little, little bit wouldn't be an issue if the capacitor is large, but we are also, uh, you know, we, 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 want, we want more and more and more. So we are squeezing these capacitors as much as possible. So these guys are tiny. The amount of charge they have tiny, and they can escape rather quickly. Now, that's annoying. That is really ridiculously annoying. And what we can do is, uh, this is a, you know, the, the leakage is a constant thing. So there is an num amount of current, a number of electrons escape per time, which is the current. And uh, we can sort of kind of know about it. And before this guy loses enough charge to forget, we refresh it. We read it out, write it back again. That's called a refresh. Now, every computer that you use, I see many laptops open, all of them have gigabytes of memory. They will refresh roughly every 260 milliseconds. So five to 15 times a second, your entire memory is being read out and, re uh, and written back. You don't notice it because why uh, we have so much memory that we are not using all of it. So there is always some little break in between 
where, you know, things are not happening. So you can quickly go and say, okay, what do we have? One, 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 zero. You have one, one, zero. You read it out, you write it back. You read it out, you write it back. You read it out, you write it back. If it sounds crazy, it is. But, you know, little area, higher density, we love it. Question, yes. Uh, you would. <laughs> how would you know which bits are one? Well, I think about it. I'm accessing them all parallel, and I would. I mean, if I knew what bits are one, I wouldn't need to store them, right? I mean, so it's a chicken egg problem. Yeah, sure, but like you have like a first line that only allows the refresh process to happen if that's. Um, Corresponding bits is one or But what about the next bit? They're all connected to the controller. Okay. I'll give you an advice. <laughs> one advice for engineering. Don't solve any problems that you don't you have not established as a problem, okay? Don't spend time solving something that you don't know is really the problem. Uh, our, my engineering students make this mistake a lot. You want to optimize things without knowing what the performance is. You come and say, hey, I did this to save power. Uh, say, okay, how much power did you save? You say, now it's 10 milliwatts. You say, okay, what was it before? You say, I don't know, but I optimized it. <laughs> like, and before it was five milliwatts, you know? So that's, that's usually the problem. But yeah, I mean, uh, the refresh is an issue. And refresh bothers people. So there are people who have figured out things. How can I do this better, more efficient, and things like that. However, the moment you use DRAM, uh, you will have to refresh. There are also some, some things that uh, you know, are not completely obvious. When you are a DRAM manufacturer, people, uh, you cannot put this refresh rate just to the limit. It cannot be that. If you wait 65 milliseconds, the memory will forget everything. So you refresh at 64. You know, it's that's not what they do. If they will finish, uh, if they will uh, forget in 65, they would refresh every millisecond. Why? There are certain operating conditions like higher temperatures where the leakage is much higher. So usually that is the thing that limits memories is the high temperature corner because uh, in electronics or not in capacitors, but in transistors, uh, this guy, the leakage current is exponential with the temperature. So the higher temperature corner, 100, 120 degrees actually tells you uh, or determines most of your things. So there are people that can play around with the refresh rate of their memories the same way that you are tuning the speed of your processor. So there are ways to, to make things a bit faster. Question. Uh, when you open up an old computer, it's capacitors are about as big as a cell phone something. So, uh, you know, essentially uh, the, the unit of capacitance is farads, right? So, uh, and it tells you essentially how many coulombs, how much charge is, is stored uh, over what uh, electrical field. And there is, when you, when you calculate the capacitance of a system, there is a dielectric material, how much it is resisting these things and how thin you can make. And with that, you can actually play a lot. So material science played a lot of role in making capacitors larger. Now, they, when you open the old computers, what you see are power capacitors. So those are for filtering the ripples from 50 hertz and other things. And those capacitors are huge. We call them millifarads, although milli is a small number. Whereas these guys are in the femtofarads, so 10 to the minus 15. Uh, the other ones are 10 to the minus 3. 
So there is a million time, million difference also in the capacitance values when you look at electronic circuits. So they are not all the same. But if you can make structure smaller, you can also create smaller capacitances. And the DRAMs are manufactured differently, as I said, because uh, they are tuned to make better capacitors at the expense of everything else. They are tuned to make better capacitors and they are tuned to make transistors that leak very little. And again, that's a, uh, that's a trade-off. If you leak very little, this means that you completely turn off, so you cannot turn on very fast, meaning that the, those transistors are also slower. There you have your dilemma, right? DRAMs are slower to access for multiple reasons, one of which being is you try to detect that tiny, tiny difference in the value. I mean. We are not telling you the whole story. It's not like those bit lines, these, uh, these data lines move from zero volts to five volts. They move like a tiny bit. They move like, you know, it's like you're, you're like, okay, it's a one. You know, they, they move like just the tiniest, tiniest, like 10 millivolts, 20 millivolts. We say, yeah, that's a one. They move down 20 millivolts. We say, yeah, that's a zero. Uh, so we are fighting, or we are, uh, electrical engineers that design memories and their readout circuits are playing every trick in the book to make it faster, to make it denser, to make it less power. But let's not go too much into the details. Question. <laughs> well, you have to read and write. I mean, you have to read it out and write it back again. I mean, the good news is it doesn't need to, the, the refresh can be done inside the memory itself, right? So the guys who designed the memory would add a refresh controller and they would do that. Uh, by the way, I mean, uh, if you are, who's interested in space? Great. So you want to go SpaceX to space? So when you go to space, there, there is an issue. There are all these charges hitting your your electronic circuits, and they also get uh, damage. There is an ionized charge, so that, that has a lot of energy. If it hits the right spot, he can actually cause bit flips. We call uh, that single event upsets and, and things like that. So those things happen with some regularity. And if you are sending things to the space, then you start doing things even for static memories where you are scrubbing them where you are constantly reading and writing back. Maybe you have also error correction codes and things like that. So we do this. It's price of, of, the, of doing this stuff. Great. OK. So let's, uh, this one should now be familiar. In this case, in this drawing, uh, just to make sure we are not discussing whether or not I use a capacitor, or I use uh, an SRAM cell, it wouldn't matter. The situation is the same. Here I have two address lines. I have four word lines, so I'm detecting whether or not address is 1, 1. Then I activate this thing. If it's 1, 0, I activate this line. If it's 0, 1, I activate this line, 0, 0, this line. And these are my three bits. It could be SRAM. It could be DRAM, then it would be a capacitor, but the organization is exactly the same. And now what happens? Well, if I apply the address one zero, this decoder, which is essentially four AND gates, right? We'll see that this word line is activated. So these switches would close on the third line. This word line would activate, and whatever is stored will go here and uh, appear at the output. And if I want to read something else, well, I will then change the address, and I will say, hey, I want to read this thing. And uh, the fun question was, if I want to write it, well, then I'm going to have my uh, big guy here at the bottom, I will activate, you know, I'll say, hello, we are activating the word line. And the guy thinks that, oh, they activated the word line. Let me tell my knowledge to the world. 
no, there is this big avalanche coming across you. And you say, maybe this is not what I am supposed to memorize. So this is how it is uh, working. Uh, now, once again, going into these boxes, if I had, if this is a stored bit before, so I could either have a DRAM where I'm storing the data on the capacitor. So this is what I was drawing there. Sorry, it's the um, you know mirror of this thing. Or I could have an SRAM where I have the word line coming here. Uh, the data is held here, and this has the uh, inverse or the correct one. That's a definition. It could be correct and inverse. It's just your way of looking at it. Uh, Bit line and word line are the names that we traditionally use on the drawing. I just said data because it seemed at that point when I was drawing a smarter idea. It isn't. Bit line and word line are the more official names. Questions about this part? Boring, Frank. Continue. OK. Now, we have discussed, where's my green? We have so far looked at the array structure. So we understood the array part. We discussed this one. We discussed this one. Now let's come to the non-volatile ones, the ones that do not need uh, power. And uh, we, we look at a specific version of it. Now a question came. Uh, ROM means uh, read-only memory. It's one of those acronyms that they made to look similar to this one, random access memory. Um, yeah, why not? It works. So read-only memories can be made much denser because we don't need to reprogram them. We write them once during manufacturing. They are manufactured one way, and uh, forever and ever, they hold the content. There are some which you could reprogram uh, there are some which you could write only once, and then forever and ever they hold it. Uh, there are versions of it. But this is used for uh, keeping the content that will not change. And uh, this could be configuration data. It could be some lookup tables. It could be a serial number in a system that you want to embed into these things. These days, however, uh, you use quite frequently things that look like read-only memories, but they can be rewritten a number of times. Uh, the most of USB sticks that you use use this technology where um, you, um, you can reprogram them the same way uh, the FPGAs that you use have a uh, flash memory outside. And that memory can hold the configuration, so you can switch off the FPGA. Then when you turn it on again, the configuration that you have made using Vivado Vitis tools can be reloaded to the FPGA, and the FPGA would, so to say, configure itself on the boot, and you can work. Now, the ROMs can be made very, very simply. You still have the decoder, but essentially, you could just connect them and say, hey, I have uh, data here, and if I, if I want to have a zero, I'll just make a pull down. If I don't have anything, I will not connect anything, and I can read these things out. So, and uh, this is actually very interesting if you are a geek. The rest can leave. Uh, in all chips, I told you the old chips look much better. In all chips, you can actually physically look at the chip, and you would see these dots on read-only memories. So you can just look at it and read the bit pattern. But you have to find some really, really old chips from the 1980s. Uh, on the internet, you will find many examples. Um, it works the same way. The only difference is we cannot reprogram them once it is there because they are usually burned in or manufactured this way. Now, they also give us opportunities to create funny logic because you look at it and you say, hey, if there's a one zero, it is one. If it's a zero one, it's one. One one, it's zero. Zero zero is, I say, hey, this is like a logic thing. And sure enough, 
you can realize that, hey, I can make any, uh, any logic function by using a memory, a lookup table of sufficient size. Vice versa, you can make a memory out of logic functions, and we call that synthesized memories. Uh, what happens in, your, in the FPGA that you use for your exercises is actually a little bit more fancier. Instead of ROM, they use a regular static memory to program the functionality of the lookup table. So this is what happens inside. You have a lookup table. This is a two-bit lookup table. And you have the logic functions realized inside as, as an SRAM. And here is an example where you say, OK, I want to have like this small memory. These are my inputs. This is the function. I just store these bits. As long as there is power, I can use it. And then after, I am done. OK. Now, we talk so much, we explain so much, and what we are trying to do in, uh, not next week, next week we are doing programming, but the week after we will start building the processor. And the thing that bothers us is something like this. We want to write instructions that do something like, Something like this. So this is an R-type instruction for our MIPS. And at one point, in order to do this addition, I have to read this. I have to read this, add them together, and then I have to write it back to some place. So these are registers. And you realize that it is like a memory. It has 32 locations. But I want to have an array of 32, 32-bit values, but I want to use it slightly differently. I want to be able to have two addresses, one for this and one for this, read one value corresponding to each, and then have a third address where I write the third one. If I can do this, everything I need to do for my operation, I can do in one step. Can I do something like this? So this is what we are uh, trying to, to, to do for the processor. So we actually, if the question is, do I have to do it like this complicated? I, can I not do it using regular memory arrays? Sure. But then at any given time, I can only read one value. So if I want to do this, first step, I have to read this. Then I have to read this. Then I need another step to write it back. So sometimes you say, no, I want to be able to do it even better. I want to you know, put things together so that they work with one clock. I apply two addresses, read two corresponding values. And at the next cycle, I want to write back the result immediately. This type of... Multi-ported memory, we say multi-ported, it has two read ports and one write port, are quite common for processors. They are specialized memories, and you guessed it, it cannot really work with this very simple structure that we had here, because you don't have one data or one bit line, you would have two bit lines to read and one bit line to write. So they are internally much more complicated, but they help us make faster processors. There are obviously versions of it where you want to read only one, read one, write one, two, read one, write, uh, four, read, two, write. Uh, there are, yes. I like it, like opera glasses, I mean. <laughs> okay. We will see this part, we will use this very much in about two weeks. Now, we talked about this thing, but you say we are not really interested in manufacturing anything. We know how to use Verilog. We know how to deal with them. How about how do I express this in Verilog? You say, you know what? It's actually described very, very simply. This is what a single 
256 times three memory module with one read and write port looks like. Let's take a look what is happening at the, the top. I have a clock. I need a write enable signal because whenever I want to have the big guy overwrite things, I need to tell it. I have to say, look, we are writing something over. I have an 8-bit address. Why? Because I need 256 different values. Then I have my 3-bit uh, write and 3-bit read data. So they can be separate, the data that I'm reading and writing. One of them is an input, the other one is an output. Now, this is the array, 256 values, each of three bits. Just to clarify, I want... In this example, I want the width to be three. This is 256. We are not storing much. So how does the read access work? Well, very boring. RAM A, so the content index A becomes the read. That's it. It's combinational, right? So you have an array and just pick this thing. How would this be realized? Well, it's a giant multiplexer, right? Somewhere there is the value and I'm just reading these things out. How about writing? Well. If you have a write enable, if there's a clock, take the write data and put it to the address indicated by the address line. That would be it. Now, when you write this code, would you get an SRAM, like one block, or would you get uh, 700 something flip flops that are organized with multiplexers at the output and things like that? Most likely, you will get 700 flip-flops. I mean, you will have this memory array realized as flip-flops. It's the compiler sometimes that when he looks at your writing, the Vivado will realize and say, hey, Frank is trying to describe a memory array. And inside the FPGA, I already have some memories, some SRAMs splattered around. And I realized that I could just, instead of realizing this in many, many flip-flops, I could just use one of those memory arrays I have. So this is what is happening. Uh, there is some amount of work, obviously, to be done in the compiler so that they can realize you are actually accessing a, um, a memory in an array configuration or not. Now, the great news. Oh, sorry. Sorry? Inside the FPGA, you would have statigrams. Uh, because the FPGAs themselves uh, are manufactured in a technology that, is, that wouldn't make very good DRAMs. Uh, so those would, be, uh, those would be SRAMs. However, you can attach external D DRAM modules to the FPGA. Those would be the external chips. And there would be a controller that allows you to access the DRAM. Questions? I have some great news for you. The great news is I ran out of slides. We learned today different ways of storing data, register static memory, dynamic memory. We learned the array organization. We realized that we can sacrifice parallel access to a compact form. And we can only read one row at a time. We will come back and talk about memories a lot. Otterberg is a specialist in memories. He lives and breathes memories. And he's going to give uh, very exciting lectures on caches, memory hierarchies, as well as their own research uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, next week, we will start, go back again to programming now that we know the last detail about the circuits. And we, we saw these instructions, they didn't really make so much sense. Uh, we will see how they combine to make program fragments and we will see how they're going. If you are in a good mood, the one that I, the, the lecture I could recommend is Friday first lecture. Uh, 
I, there will be the opportunity of making a lot of fun of me because I'll try to attempt something. And there's a great chance that I will fail spectacularly. If you're not here, that's okay. <laughs> but yeah, if you want to see me fail here, trying to play with this thing, uh, be here next Friday, uh, the first hour. Thanks a lot. Enjoy your weekend. Still, I don't care.